Today I'm reviewing another Siglent product. This has been lent to me by Rob of Tapping Technologies. If you're in New go and check his website out. I'll chuck it link down below. I actually wouldn't mind having one of these, to be honest. Maybe one day I'll buy myself one. I don't know, but anyway, this is just on loan. Unfortunately, I don't get to keep this one, which is a bit of a shame, but anyway, let's take a look. the bag. I'll get it out and I'll come back. There you go, we've got a bag. What's in here? Massive box considering what this is. It's quite surprising. Signal do really good packaging to protect the equipment until it actually gets there. Right, we have a handheld oscilloscope. Comes with a power supply. What's that rated at? 9.5 volts at 4 amps. Chuck that back in there for the time being. Here it is. It's a pretty tight fit into this bag. Well secured. And this is one of what I've been playing with, so it's got a bit of dust on it, so it's a bit of use and stuff, you know. It's a demo unit, I think. So it's a fairly sizable thing. If you see a picture of one of these things, you don't think it's actually that big. But, you know, <laughs> you think it's like a multimeter size. No, 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 it really isn't. So this is the SHS 800X series. So it's not the 800 series, it's the 800X. It's a newer version. What else do we have in here? Got an adapter of some kind. This isn't only an oscilloscope. It's also a multimeter. And it's got this attachment here to convert something. It's an SCD-10A. 10 amp fuse. Apparently there's a fuse in there somewhere. Okay. 60 volt DC, 60 amp AC. I think that's a current shunt, basically. Because the meter just has voltage inputs. So I'm guessing this is a 10 amp current shunt inside a package, which you shove in there. Like that, to give you a current measurement. Nice. And you've got another one. This is an SCD 600MA. So I think this is a 600 milliamp and it's a 10 amp so you can do two different current ranges. Okay. Quick start guide. Usual stuff. Calibration verification. Have a probe set. It's just like a standard signal set. Just standard ones. These are, I think, are just PVC leads. Try filling through the case. Uh, actually, there might be silicon. I can't tell, I don't know, open it. Um, <coughs> what else have you got in here? Have a shoulder strap thing. Obviously, these are meant for field use generally, so you want to make sure you're not going to drop it or something. And also, got a USB cable, so a micro USB to USB A. Probably for remote interface, stuff like that, if you want to maybe download data off it, I'm guessing, or something like that. I don't actually know. I haven't looked into this yet. These current shunts, just by the way, um, these are standard spacing, so these will plug straight to the front of another meter. I just tried it, and yep, it works. Well, it fits anyway. And this case has also got a pouch on the outside. What's in there? Probes. Two probes, because this is a two-channel unit. I'm not sure which colour scheme this is using. It's got a blue on here and looks like an orange on there. Doesn't say. I'm not quite sure what the colours are. We might find out when we turn it on. Okay. Right, so let's actually have a look at this thing and see what we've got. So obviously we looked on this cover here, which is the multimeter input. You've got like a slinging point here and here, which I guess was for that shoulder strap I found. What's in here? It looks like it wants to come out from this end, but oh, there we go. So we got, I don't like the way that's going to bend backwards like that. Hmm. It's putting a lot of stress on there. Not sure I'm keen on that. Um, I think that will eventually snap off. Because it doesn't actually pull out. It pulled out more, but you're right. So on here we've got a calibration point, USB socket, another USB socket, and the hole which this thing, this tab here, is supposed to lock into. 
But yeah, I'm really not liking how much stress that's putting on that joint, like just trying to get that pulled around. That is gonna get ripped off, that is really not nice. Um Siglant, you need to make that better. That might last. On the top, it's upside down. I don't know what will happen to electrons, I can't tell you. Channel 1, channel 2 obviously. Cat 2 at 300 volts. That's the isolation ratings. I don't know if they're isolated from each other. They have a plastic sheath around the outside. So that is non-contact. I can't touch the metal. So I suppose from a safety perspective it's probably right. Which means they probably are linked together. On this side we've got obviously the handle here. And another little compartment was behind this one. This one pulls out further. <laughs> um, oh, that's a DC jack, so that's for charging it. That is really recessed in there, look at that. That's really deep in there. Hmm. Let's actually have a look at this one, think about it. Let's shove that in. Oh yeah, okay, that's all right. You can grab hold of that, all right. It's just really in there, I'm quite surprised. But, no, that's fine. It's not a special plug or anything, I think, it's standard. And there's the back. Big lithium cell. So this particular model was this HS820X, which is the 200 megahertz version. Very nice. Apparently lithium battery packs can be a problem because of shipping and all sorts of stuff like that. You get those paranoia aspects around lithium cells. They could be a bit annoying. I don't know if there's much problem with that worldwide. Maybe it has to be shipped rather than flown or something. I've got no idea. But yeah, I can imagine that's going to be a problem if you ever want to replace that pack, maybe. Or if you want to get a second pack, maybe you might have to jump through some hoops to get that sorted out. And it also looks like it's got a tilting barrel on the back here. Let's have a look. Yes, it does. Here we go. And there's a segment seal. Right there, hiding underneath that. Okay, nice. Right, let's power this thing up. Also, if you like my review videos, don't forget to like and also subscribe if it's your first time here and you're not actually subscribed yet. You might see more stuff if you're interested in. So a quick look at the front panel, then we'll power it up. So we've got some F buttons across the bottom here, which obviously related to the screen. We've got scope, meter and recorder options. So obviously scope is the oscilloscope, meter is the multimeter function and recorder is a data recorder option. So that's actually means you can do data logging on it over a period of time. There are some settings in that, I believe. Channel 1, channel 2 controls. So we've got vertical and horizontal controls here. Trigger button. Um, trigger level setting shift button here for doing the second functions of these buttons. Such as zoom, reference, math, save, recall, history, decoding. It's got a decoding button as well. Got a rotor encoder just here. Run stop, auto setup, default setup, utility buttons, display and persistence button, acquire, um, and that's the buttons. Oh, yeah, one more button, the power button, the most important button of them all, the power button. Let's push it. How long does it take to boot up? Let's find out. I don't know how well charged the battery is, I might have to plug power into it yet. There we go, we have a display, battery showing, it was about, I don't know, was that third or half full, some of that. So which bit do you want to see, do you see the screen or the buttons? Or do I turn it sideways to make it all landscape? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Should be on TikTok, a vertical video, now. <clears throat> so, screen looks. As you expect, it's an oscilloscope screen. So obviously skip scope meter functions, system status. So just look at the F buttons along here. So system information, it looks no different to any other signal oscilloscope. F5 to exit. Um, quick cow will do that. Sound is currently turned off. I am going to turn it on because I like sound. I like button confirmations. Language options, bunch of them in there. Next page, do self cow, date and time, that's already said, although it's wrong. So that in time is actually currently incorrect. I might sort that out later on. Updates. Screen saver is off, so I won't do a screen save. Also your self test. Reference position, so you can choose how you set these up. So fixed offset or fixed position. And the same for this one here as well. Right, fixed delay, 
fixed position. That depends on how you have these points set up. So when you're scrolling, like you expand in the time base for example, if you've got the point here off to one side for example, so previously I was in the utility menu so I just pushed the utility button down here and I got back into there now. So reference position is where I was looking before, horizontal fixed delay and fixed position. So that will change how it handles the alignments up here. So if I shift this over, see so it's now shifted over here, it's giving you it milliseconds here. And then as you zoom in and out, you see the thing is moving as well, right? So it's always in the same position there, but this is shifting with it. If you change to the other type, as you shift in and out, that stays exactly the same place. So if you get an issue where you find a trigger point is always moving around on you and it's a bit annoying, change the other type. The oscilloscopes have this feature as well, if you're able to find it. And if I wanted to recenter that, I, what I should be able to do is do shift and zero. There we go, that's centered. Right, easy enough. So that's the utility menu, let's look at the display menu. Vector display, dot display, usual stuff, color gradients, on or off. Persistence, selectable, just like you do on the main like benchtop oscilloscopes. The user interface is basically the same as the desktop oscilloscopes, it's actually quite nice. Um, all the same settings on that. Transparency, LCD backlight. I might actually increase it a little bit. That's better. Shows up on camera a little bit now. But it will obviously reduce running time. So this is actually a button, I think. It is. So it allows you to do selections through this instead. I'm going to get out of that. Okay, um, that's all that done. So, it, the brighter the screen, obviously this time your battery's going to last, because it has to work harder to have the brightness. Sensible stuff. Acquire menu, acquisition normal, peak detect, average and e res, XY mode, memory depth, it's got 12 down to 12k, or 12 meg to 12k I should say, or 12k to 12 meg, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, next page, interpolation, X or sign X and X, acquisition mode, fast or slow, roll mode, disable, sequencing, so it's got sequence memory. Um, okay, that's that stuff. Pretty basic so far, it's just like a desk oscilloscope. No different so far. Trigger setup, next common one. So, all the different types as usual. Should I make this a bit bigger so you can see the screen? Do you want to see the screen or do you want to see the buttons? Maybe I'll go to the screen, eh? It might be a bit easier for you guys to see. Let's focus on the buttons. Or on the screen. How's that? Okay. So, there's the triggers. And it's also got a demonstration showing what they are. So, like, do the bench scopes. Trigger source, channel 1, channel 2. I want channel 1 because I'm not going to be using channel 2 right now. It's going to demonstrate channel 1. Rising, falling edge, alternating. Hold off time. Off or adjustable. I'll leave it off for now. Second page. Coupling, DC, AC. Low frequency, high frequency rejection as always. Noise rejection and auto, normal, single or false. Okay, that's that menu. And of course you got cursors and all the usual stuff for that. Um, you got menus in here, mode manual, tracking. Yeah, um, got a print option which will be probably saved to SD card or there you go, saved an image of the screen then somewhere. <laughs> I haven't figured that out yet. Measurements, of course, we've got measurements built in. These are the different types you can select exactly the same as the desktop scopes, no problem there. I always have RMS as one of the measurements. Select that, that's nice for control, quite like that. Um, Okay, back out of that. Um, all measure off, that's the other thing to do is turn on all measure, which shows you everything as an overlay. Gate time, if you want to have gating. Okay, that's that one. Clear the sweeps, so if you want to do a refresh of the screen. Menu, you can turn the whole menu off and on, which gives you more screen real estate for the other stuff. 
shows you more information like this is all sort of compressed up a little bit otherwise it's not a big change but it's a little bit you know maybe helpful that's the bulk of those also you got channel 2 we can turn it on as well that will show up with all the same features also your channel buttons bring up the channel indication stuff like so we got DCAC coupling ground as always bandwidth limit 4 120 meg usual adjustment for these levels will be coarse and fine probes all different ones in there I don't know if it allows you to do custom ones let's go to the bottom yeah you can you can do custom probes so no problem there let's leave it on 10 times for the time being um, and we got volts which would be amps as well this giving a version on and off just do that's away for offset it's currently offset I don't want that to be offset zero volts here we go um, trace visible or hidden obviously if you're not actually using the channel maybe or if you're doing maths functions you can actually hide it I suppose okay and obviously channel 2 be exactly the same setup that is that stuff I suppose so obviously that's on the scope function let's push the meter button there's the multimeter function so what we got in here so DC AC volts resistance diode continuity capacitance and DC current oh and AC current that's there as well okay we'll make sure on DC volts um, rotor mode on and off so it actually tells you what the offset is here as well auto mode in volts mini volts manual range as well you can do manual ranging okay and you got measure logger so 0.1 seconds is currently set um, we can just sit on that I wonder be quite some time minutes you got the minutes there 10 minutes log interval and I think the smallest was 0.1 yeah 0.1 seconds as short as they can do four traces potential and DC volts and no no hmm okay so that's that bed let's do start logging there we go so that's just doing visual representation so that's quite nice um, so if you actually had multimeter probes hooked up to this thing and I'm sticking my fingers near the port which is probably going to be picking up some noise you know radiated RF or whatever which will be generating that so yeah, okay well that works stop display vertical scales yeah okay hold on to the display you can set the time frame auto set which probably means it sorts itself out okay cursors different ones here, turn them on and off as you want turn them off for now ok save and recall so you want to store it I suppose you can do that yeah, save it save types binary CSV or MATLAB a file manager here as well so you can choose where to store it because it does have a USB port on the side so you can actually just plug a flash drive into that and store it to that I'm sure cut copy paste, you can move things around between places as well careful with that I think sometimes um, okay so the other thing we can do is the recorder it is the recorder which I, is that what this is in now confirm exit there we go right now we're back to the meter so recorder is that the same thing we're in just now so we've got logger recording setting start, this is what I was doing just now wasn't it stop, let's go to the settings, see what this can say about it stopping, it's saved it to a file apparently um, one sample a second how to ooh, there's quite a few um, right, so one sample a second up to 1,000 samples a second right and here it tells you how much time you can record for you see that? it's a bit small on screen but I can see it fine but obviously on camera in the shot it's probably not helpful so if I go through each one you can see the recording time changes so obviously the longer the sample interval the longer it can record for so one sample a second record for 4 and 2 days 
Um, we need to record two. I don't have flash drive plugged in, so I won't even give the option right now. That's not surprising. So I've plugged in a probe. I'm touching the end of the probe tip now. That should generate some noise. Yep, there we go. It's logging off the scope probe. So that's what it's actually using. So I'm guessing in this case, the recorder is only for the scope probe. In meter mode, you've got the other logging system built into that as well. Yeah, it's weird. They've got sort of different setups. Let's stop the recording. So, in meter mode, we had the measure logger, right? Which is the same kind of thing, but it's obviously off the meter terminals that are behind here. And then you've got the recorder, which is running off the scope. So wouldn't you think that the scope button would have... Let's come back out of there. If you go into scope, you'd have a logger option in here, like the meter option does, so it'd be the same. Or on the recorder, you could choose... I don't know, you've got a sample logger and measure logger. Is it already there? Is that measure logger? Is that the multimeter? I think it is. Touch the scope probe. I don't know, maybe not. No, that's typically scope probe. So, touch it again. Yeah, that's definitely scope probe that's logging there. Right. Exit that. Confirm. You got a sample logger. Okay, so it's got two different versions of logging on the scope probe system. Okay. But on the meter, you got measure logger on the meter as well. So you got measure logger over here and measure logger over here. Which aren't the same thing, from what I can tell. They're also definitely different. Should they have different terminology for them functions? I think so. So I'll just turn on the PDV as too many. Let's just check the multimeter accuracy. Right, I've got to set the 0V server. I've only turned it on so it's not warm yet. But the resolution should, probably shouldn't matter on this. Having a few decimal places wrong on this probably isn't going to matter. So let's do 1V. Yeah, it looks perfect. So, yeah, all good. 1 mV high there, 2 mV high there. Let's change ranges then. So it must be 6,000 count or something. 10 volts looks perfect. But as we're getting to the top end of this, there we go, this is the 5 volt one. And we're getting 2 mV high there, let's go up a little bit lower. Smaller increments. So I think it's just basically 6,000 count. There's 6 there, yeah, changes ranges there. Where does it come back down to? There you go, 5.6, drops back down again. Okay, it's a few counts out. It's not too bad though. I imagine it'd be good enough. So that's changed to millivolt range. Now this, I don't actually have calibration data for below one volt. I've got zero volts and one volt. I don't have the other uh, values there, but it should be pretty close, I think. So 100 millivolts, let's bang on. 200, yep. 300, one count out. 400 one count out, 500 one count out. Now I bet this is going to range at 600. There we go, it is. So I could do six and down about five nine, and that's three counts out again. So it does look like it's three counts out or so at the top of the range on millivolts and volts. So could be a slight calibration thing there. My aiming temperature here is 24 degrees right now, so it's slightly warmer than it should be. Maybe that's affecting it just a little bit. And obviously we've got this nice bar rifle on the bottom here. I don't know how fast it responds, let's try something. It's not really any faster than the actual meter display itself, is it? I suppose you need something pulsing, maybe it will show up more. I don't know. So one little test, check the continuity between the two Earths up here. Yep, they are indeed linked. What about the negative down here? Is this linked to the Earth as well? No, it's not. Positive? No. So those aren't linked, just the scope negatives are. 
this is something to watch out for. So I suppose we'd also check things like the negatives down here. Let's check this one. That's isolated. And the negative on the DC voltmeter here. Well, on the multimeter inputs, I should say. That's isolated. Okay. The USB port. Let's get on there properly. USB port shield. Isolated. Scope inputs. Isolated. Okay, that's alright. And something you may have just noticed is this viewing angle. You can still see that on camera really well. Look at that. It's still readable even over there. Look at that. That's actually really good. Let's try it downwards, shall we? So we looked at this, shall we? Downwards, that's looking pretty good. Even right down there. Upwards, not quite so good, but not bad. Probably more to do with my lighting than anything else. Yeah, this has got an excellent viewing angle on display. That's actually really impressive. Well, I think we should chuck a waveform into this thing next and just uh, check the oscilloscope part out, actually try getting something on the screen. So I'm currently injecting a 1 MHz signal, no modulation, just 100 MHz. I haven't set the screen up or anything like that for this yet. Um, let's go to the menu. Fill this somewhere. Here we go, over here. AC coupling, that's fine, that'll do. Full bandwidth limit, that's fine. Probe is actually a one times because I'm using a cable. Go to one times there. Okay. Um, volts here, that's fine. Got an offset for some reason, I don't want an offset. You can go around this menu and use it like this. Or we could go down to default, maybe, which should be zero. There it is. And trace visible thing. Right. So we should be able to go faster and faster until we actually find the waveform. There it is. Okay, so I'm not using a 50 ohm load on this thing. There is no 50 ohm option I've seen in the menu either, is there? No, there was no 1 mega ohm or 50 ohm switching. Obviously it doesn't have that built in. So peak to peak 576 RMS 194. Yeah, I'm actually getting a wrong value here. I'm going to stick a dummy load on this and we'll carry on from that. Okay, that's slightly better. We're getting closer there. So 100 millivolts of vision now, we're getting basically there. That's a nice waveform on there. So what I actually want to do is adjust my output here to get a nice value here. And we'll check the bandwidth out and see how it actually handles the bandwidth. And look at that aspect of it. The reading is a bit down from what I thought it'd be. I mean, I'm generating 100 millivolts. So I really thought I would be seeing 100 millivolts at this point with the load on. You know, this is a 50 ohm load, a through termination. So that should be 100 millivolts. And was it 6% out? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll check channel 2, see what that does. So the output on channel 2, obviously I need to set the actual input up properly so it's not doing the wrong stuff. I've got DC input on this one. So... Oh, of course the measurements are on the wrong channel. Yeah, of course they are. Channel 2 measurement type peak to peak and RMS. Okay, there's the peak-to-peak -peak one, where's the RMS one? Is it underneath the menu? Huh, okay. Um, right, yeah, turn period off. Give more room for the other ones, there we go. It's wrapping over. So even though it was enabled, I couldn't see it on screen because there wasn't enough. We all stay for it, so that's fine. So now we can do, and this channel 2 is also giving about the same value. If anything, it's reading slightly lower. So this is reading 93. I've changed the channel, the um, trigger point over, or as you'll be able to see on screen. This is reading better <laughs> when it's not being triggered. Trigger setup, back to channel 1 again. And you're off. Back to 94. So there is a, a 1 millivolt difference between the channels. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, it's close. So I'm going to set this up so we can do the bandwidth measurement and see what happens. The only difference between the two channels is that channel 1 is on AC, 
50 millivolts of division because I've got the times one setting and this is on DC so maybe there's a slight difference because of the AC versus DC thing AC's got a serious capacitance in there to block the DC aspect so you think it'd be a bit lower but I, I don't know anyway yeah it's, it's we'll figure it out so I've just tweaked the output to give us exactly 100 millivolts on here now we'll try some different frequencies and we'll see how the unit handles it so first I'm going to go down to 1 kilohertz also 10 kilohertz as slow as I can go on here I'll get that right one day, one day. bring it up and see what we get 102 millivolts there that's fine you usually expect a slight variation there so let's do um, 2 megahertz I'll go back the other way 102 still there that's good 5 megahertz Still 99, basically 100. 10, still 100. See 20, still 100. See 50. Hundred and three, it's peaked up slightly there. Do 100 megahertz. Still 100, that's good. 150. Oh, down to 92 there, so we're starting to see a drop off there. Let's just go back a bit, let's go 120. That's still good. 130. Still good. 140. There's a drop there. So between 130 and 140 it starts to drop. Still within spec though, still only a very small drop. So let's go to say 180 megahertz now. It's the 87 millivolts showing up there. 200, 80 millivolts, so it's still exceeding its spec. 210, 78, so it's still exceeding. 220, it's getting close. 230, there we go, it's gone below now. 225, yeah, 228, that's close. So it's called it 228 megahertz. Is a 3 dB point. Don't forget this is rated at 200 megahertz, so it's exceeding its rating by 10%. I think that's fine. So my next standard test is to look at the display whilst attempting to confuse it. <laughs> this can be a tricky test. Some just really struggle with it and just cannot do it. Some take a bit of setting up and tweaking to get into work. Let's see how we go. So I've got a 10 megahertz signal coming in. Haven't changed the level, still about 100 millivolts. No difference there. As you can see, I've got a couple of waveforms shape on the display. I'm going to introduce a 1 kilohertz AM modulated signal and see how the thing handles it. Now, actually, one little point is this frequency counter here is very slightly out by a couple of digits. See, it's stuff here I didn't point out before. I think it's a hardware frequency counter. A lot of the signal scopes do have hardware frequency counters in them. Let me just go to high frequency first and just look at that. This is um, 220 megahertz. Yep, that's fine. Sometimes the frequency counter will still work way above the statue operating frequency. 300, 400 megahertz. Struggling a little bit there. We'll just um, do that. Yeah, struggling. I'll come back to this in a second. Let's see where we've got this. 400 megahertz, you can see the waveform. <laughs> it's way down, but it's almost working. 400 megahertz. That's pretty good actually. 350 megahertz. By the way, 350 megahertz actually works. This is usable 350 megahertz. Just don't expect the voltage to be right. Hmm, interesting. Okay, right back to the other test. 10 megahertz. I've oh, got sidetracked. <coughs> it never happens. So there's that signal there. I'm all again back to where we were. So there's 10 megahertz signal. Let's turn on AM modulation and see what happens. So there's 90% AM modulation, let's just scale this down a little bit. And that's normal, that's the kind of thing you'd normally see, not unexpected. So let's change this to try and see if we can actually see the modulation. You often get aliasing and all sorts of noise and rubbish. Can it discriminate? It can. Look, there it is. Look at that, that looks really nice. All I've got to do is get it to trigger. Triggering it is the tricky bit.
Oh, so this is just in trigger level. See if we can get just with that. Sometimes you can just do that and that's enough to get it. I mean, it's really close. Do some trigger level alone. It's not bad. But sometimes that's not enough. Right. That's not bad, but we could do better, I'm sure. So, let's stick that about there somewhere, 50% or so. Trigger setup, hold off, and let's play with the hold off time. And that's doing trigger level still. Mm. Hold off time. Why can't I adjust the hold off time with that? Is that because it's still active? Really? That doesn't take precedence over that? Uh, okay, right. Fine. <laughs> so, the trick for this. We are at 500 microseconds per division. And we need to be triggering in that time frame there. So we need to get up to around 800 or so, looks of it. So let's keep going. There we go. Stable trigger. That's at 500. So if you look at the time between each pulse, right, so that's 500 there, which is right in the dip. And then there's the next one there. So it's actually closer to 1,000 each, each one, right, because of the um, frequency. We keep winding this up. There you go, starting to move around now. There we go, it's starting to false trigger again because you've gone too high. Alright, so, yeah, that's fine. Um, triggering, no worries whatsoever. That shows up really nicely. Hold off works beautifully on this one. And the display looks really good. That's nice. So the same I've just done is I've changed the display mode to now to be dots. I've still got AI modulation turned on and I'm just zooming in on it a little bit. And I'm just sort of looking at how this is looking. And you can see this distortion here which obviously because of the AI modulation riding on it. And you can actually see it. So let me just turn the AI modulation back off now. Let's bring the trigger level down so we can see the waveform. It's close enough. Um, then we can look at this high frequency stuff and let's just see that is looking really good because this is a one giga sample per second scope right so that's that if I turn on channel 2 there we go that changed the number of dots you see it changed it maybe you can see it let's get closer to this camera alright so channel 2 on Channel 2 off. You see the dot density changed. But it's still excellent. And that's on its fastest time scale. And both channels. No worries resolution there. Okay. Let me change the frequency. Because obviously I'm only at 10 megahertz. Let's go to 100 megahertz. Oh, let's go to 200. Let's do the limit. Um, frequency, yeah, 200 megahertz. There it is there. That probably shows up a bit more. Turn the channel off. There we go. So you can actually see it's got loads of sampling capacity. No worries at all trying to keep up with that. That's fine. That's got really good accuracy. The representation of what you see on screen looks really good. Based on dot mode. Which is always a good one to catch things on. So let's go back to here, back to vectors, and there we go, now we're seeing that again. Well this entire review, I haven't had power plugged onto the scope, and the battery indicator hasn't changed. So, it looks like the battery capacity of this thing is actually pretty good, because, you know, I expect to see it drop a bar or something like that, if I've been using it for a period of time, about, was it about an hour or something like that, I've been playing with it? Yeah, I think I've been playing with this thing for about an hour now, maybe slightly longer. So, you expect to see the indicator drop a little bit in that time, it hasn't changed, so... I think as far as battery runtime goes, this thing isn't a problem. Um, I think it's actually going to handle it just fine. Um, obviously it depends on your use case, but yeah, this looks really good. I'm really liking the display, the resolution. This is very nice. Um, this actually puts a lot of bench scopes to shame. To be honest, a lot of bench scopes don't do as well as this does. So uh, yeah, Sorry, let's push back in again though. Hmm. <laughs> this covers a problem.
This is going to be one of those things which annoy people. There we go. Put it in first. There we are. Right. Yeah, so this is definitely better than some bench scopes. Now, there's one button here I haven't played with. Can you see which button it is? Actually, it's decoding. I haven't done decoding. I haven't looked at any of these second functions. Hmm. Shift, math. What else have we got in here? Addition. All the standard math functions between channels, which ones you're going to do them on. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's that stuff. Um, reference menus, yeah, zoom, it's nice have zooming so you can actually zoom in and probably use the dial to change the zoom level, I'm guessing. Oh no, I'm still on trigger, am I? I'm still on trigger. There we go. Um, maybe if I wasn't zoomed into that point, maybe it'd be different. Um, so you back off. Do that. And then we'll do zoom. There we go. That's more useful. Navigate? What's navigate do? All oh, right, this is for the history menu, like segmented memory. Um, so if you do a, a bunch of frames, you can record a bunch of frames. So if you've got a infrequent trigger, which happens, could be minutes, hours apart even, you can actually tell this to trigger, or to just do single triggers or whatever, normal trigger, and it will save as much segmented memory, and you get a lot more out of it. Decoding is here. Decode option, decode one, decode two. SPI, I squared C, UART, Canon, LEN, default, single line connections, signified. How are you going to measure them? Um, channel one and channel two are the only options, so it's interesting you've got three connection options. Clock based on timeout, right, that's how they're doing this chip select. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously you, I squared C and U art would be easier to trigger off, but yeah, obviously because you got limited inputs, harder to do that. Okay. Um, but anyway, the button I was actually referring to when I started thinking about this train of thought, before I started realising I hadn't touched the sub menus, <laughs> or the sub button functions, to decode it back off again, um, and turn off zoom again, and maybe zoom back in. So, you've got this adjust button here. Is that the button? Or is it? I don't know. Should I push it? Rob's probably going, no, no, don't touch that. No. <laughs> I don't know what it does. I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> um, I'm guessing it's some calibration option or something like that. It's for closed calibration, but I would have thought it would be done through a menu system personally, but I don't know. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's some other function. Oh! The battery dropped down by one bar, finally. <laughs> it's a nice scope. So, it's, this is better than some bench scopes I've reviewed. In fact, better than quite a few of the bench scopes I've reviewed, especially the, the cheaper ones. Really good representation of the AM modulated waveform. That came out really nicely. I was quite impressed by that. That looked really good on screen. Um, all our setup, we haven't looked at that, have we? All our setup, default setup, I mean, let's do all our setup on that, see what it thinks of it. Then I'll turn the modulation back on. Yeah, that's fine. Turn the modulation back on again. 90% modulation, it's a mess. Let's see what I set up things to that. Yeah, it's picked up that, which is kind of right, but not not unsurprising. Check out the other videos down below there, other review videos and other things I've done, other repairs and electronic stuff. And uh, thanks for offering this to me, and I'll catch you later. Bye. I've got the power. <laughs>